India and Pakistan form a mysterious subcontinent full of different cultures and religions. In the colonial era, the British developed an ancient route into a highway. They named the road, which ran right through their realm, the Grand Trunk Road. Like a pulsating lifeline, the legendary route stretches for 2,500 kilometers, an unforgettable experience. The Grand Trunk Road runs from Kolkata to Benares, along the Ganges to Delhi. It crosses the Pakistani border and continues on to Lahore and Peshawar. Our journey begins in the Sundarbans on the Gulf of Bengal. These mangrove forests in the south are still the habitat of Bengal tigers and crocodiles. In this nature reserve where salt water and fresh water intermingle, the wildlife has adapted perfectly. European mariners and merchants landed in India in the 16th century. Back then, the coastal regions on the Gulf of Bengal still looked just like the Sundarbans today. For centuries, ships from Europe anchored here before returning home, laden with treasures and goods from this vast land. In order to develop, rule, and exploit the subcontinent more efficiently, the British brought goods from all over India via the Grand Trunk Road. As a result, small villages in nearby Kolkata grew into a trading center of outstanding importance, and a special place for the start of our journey. The buildings in this city of 15 million are a reminder of colonial times. At the moment, it's bedlam here. For 10 days, the people of Kolkata will be celebrating an important religious festival, the Durga Puja. Throughout the Hindu world, but especially in Kolkata in West Bengal, the faithful are awaiting the arrival of Durga, the great maternal deity in all her manifestations. Something different takes place every day. focus today is on banana plants. People take them with them on their ritual bath in the Ganges. In doing so, they pay homage to the fertility of plants that provide food. The faithful believe that the plants can also conceal aspects of the great goddess Durga. The festival is also an economic factor in Kolkata. The central flower market is a hive of activity. Every household is decorated for the festival. Countless garlands of flowers are needed for processions and altars. Families give one another flowers and invite one another to come and visit. Vast quantities of flowers and posies are turned over here and distributed to the smaller markets in the suburbs. This provides small traders, flower arrangers, and vendors with an income. So they too profit from the festival of the great goddess Durga. Another suburb in Kolkata lives from producing statues of deities for the altars and processions during Durga Puja. 
Hundreds of thousands of figurines are made throughout the year and sold to households, neighborhood communities, firms and private individuals. The sculptures are elaborately crafted from wood, clay and papier-mâché in hundreds of small workshops. Work goes on all year round because demand during Durga Puja is huge. The figurines are thoroughly sandpapered, painted, made non-slip and adorned with splendid garments. It takes many steps to create these sculptures in such a way that aspects of the goddess Durga are recognizable. The aim is to attract deities to come and linger in the statues for the duration of the festival. This calls for massive effort and a great love of detail for a celebration that lasts only a few days. Families get together and visit one another for the festival. The roads are even more congested than normal. Garlands of flowers from the wholesale market are sold on in the streets. Red powder for facial decoration is in great demand. Although the monsoon season is actually over, there are constant downpours. Climate change long since reached India too. It is particularly crowded around the temple to the goddess Kali. A visit here during the festival is a sacred duty for every Hindu. Residents have erected temples in every street just for the visits of the gods during Durga Puja. The city's great merchant families invite people into their houses. The exterior gives no indication of the splendor inside. During the puja, everyone is welcome and catered for, and allowed to marvel at the house altar and the lavish decorations. This is where the huge families come together, as well as friends, guests and visitors from the street. In every family, like the Maliks here, one of the older brothers is responsible for the spiritual procedures and observation of the rituals. Blessing of the gods, we should continue and good over the efforts, put over the good efforts to continue this puja and everything and performing because we know that the puja means that is the assembling of the soul and of every man and woman and child, child, and children and everywhere in the, they are assembled here and they are, uh, whatever they are, they are within the entire year, maybe some others we are cannot, cannot contact with it, but during the puja everywhere is there here and we are sharing our the views and we are enjoying the Durga Puja. In the streets too, people flock to the specially erected temples. Naturally, Durga Puja is a media event not only in Bengal, but throughout India. For days now, journalist Pooja Pasu has been reporting hourly on the festival for India's main news channel. This particular day is dedicated to married women and mothers. mother's place and now she's going back to her in-law's place. So, you know, this is a vermilion that we use. It's very auspicious for us. us uh, all the married ladies, they use this, uh, this vermilion and uh, so they put a vermilion in mother's face and like this way they celebrate and uh, this is the time of celebration. We are actually associated with this festival uh, from our birth. Like we are born with this festival, we can say. So like the young and the old, they are all, they all participate in this festival and this is the festival we look forward to uh, 
throughout the year. The festival is over and the altars are being taken down. The deities have left them and the people here are happy. Not just in Kolkata, throughout the entire Hindu world, the altars, some of which are very heavy, are dismantled and taken to holy lakes and rivers. They have served their purpose and offered the gods a home during the festival. But as Hinduism teaches, everything is transient, even if it was created at great cost and effort. At one time on this particular day, hundreds of thousands of divine images could be seen floating in the Ganges and the country's other rivers. But for some years now, the requirements of environmental protection have curbed this practice. The altars and the effigies of deities are still thrown into the water, but the refuse collection services fish them out of the Ganges again and dispose of them. Nothing remains of the lovingly made sculptures with their brocade fabrics, their colors and their wigs. The British took their culture to India with them. Their religion, their troops, their legal system and their palaces. Even today, many years since India achieved independence in 1947, the colonial era is still noticeable, also through the Victorian buildings and symbols. With a last look at Queen Victoria, we begin our journey. Our first destinations from Kolkata are Bodh Gaya and Varanasi on the sacred river Ganges. Throughout India and Pakistan, the Grand Trunk Road is known simply as the GT Road. Outside Kolkata, it is just a little street with lots of hustle and bustle by the roadside. Along the way, there are constant reminders of the colonial era. French locations expressing the ideal of liberty, equality, and fraternity. Danish churches and trading houses stand close to Christian churches from the days of the Portuguese, who settled in India even before the British. Today, this complex is run by the Don Bosco Order of Salesian monks. It is visited by many local inhabitants. Father Francis returned here after several years spent at various locations around the world on behalf of his order. He's been surprised by many things. From all religions, they come, flock, as you see now at this very moment. They are not all Catholics or Christians. They belong to different religions, but they all unite in showing their devotion and love to Mother Mary. And it is something nice to know that we Indians, though we belong to different cultures, languages, and uh, castes, we come together as one family. Mother Teresa has captured the heart of all Indians, not only India, I would say all world, but in India, especially in Calcutta, she is so much loved. In fact, when she died, you, must, you should have seen the crowd of people going to her with the flowers to show the last respects to her. And everyone was moved and it was, uh, so to say, loss for us, her passing away. And we are so happy today she is a saint. We've covered the first 500 kilometers on the GT road, but another 2,000 still lie ahead. In Bihar province, we experience rural India. 
Over 800 million Indians live in the most basic circumstances as farmers or harvesters. They work in the fields and tend livestock. Occasionally, we come across a brickyard. The bricks fired here are made of clay, brought by the waters of the Ganges and used here for thousands of years. This stupa dates back to the days of the Buddha. For us, it marks the start of an encounter with another world religion on the Grand Trunk Road. In the poor federal state of Bihar, the places where the Buddha taught, meditated or preached are a magnet for visitors. People come here from all over the world and visit this stupa on their way to Bodh Gaya, where, according to legend, the great Gautama Buddha found enlightenment. Thus, on the Grand Trunk Road, we reach the mecca of the Buddhist world and immerse ourselves in religious history dating back six centuries before Jesus Christ. In Bodh Gaya, we've arranged to meet Indian doctor Tanu Varma. We find her at the yoga exercises she does every morning. Dr. Varma cares for children at welfare schools all over India, where she reintroduces traditional forms of yoga and meditation. Dr. Varma is a Hindu, but it is also perfectly natural for her to visit the holy sites of Buddhism in Bodh Gaya. I'm a Hindu, but uh, Lord Buddha, he gave us a path of enlightenment. I never compare like Lord Buddha as a Buddhist or Hindu because the final path, everyone has to get the aim of life and that is enlightenment. Everyone have to travel from a different, different way, but everyone have to reach the same place. So for me, Lord Buddha as my role model and he really, he was a married person, he married, he lived his life, but he really shows the people what is the suffering and how to get off suffering from all the problems of life from the practices in a very normal way, in a very simple way. For Tanu Varma, yoga is far more than physical exercise. In India, yoga is again being used more and more to treat illness, from concentration disorders to diabetes. It's an important element of her projects with children. According to ancient scripture, diseases always come first in the mind and then it's centered in the body. So when we practice yoga, our mind, our mental status always get relaxed and we are able to get right decisions. Tanu Varma also visits schools in Bodh Gaya that are part of her project. Welfare schools financed with donations. At these institutions, this young doctor has had great success in reintroducing breathing and concentration exercises adopted from yoga. The children come from the poorest families, which do not practice these ancient health theories from the Vedas, the holy scriptures of Hinduism. Tanu Varma teaches the exercises in a friendly but strict and precise way. Thank you very much to all of you. Sabhi log roj practice karenge na? Like millions of people, every year Tanu Varma visits the holy sites in Bodh Gaya around the Bodhi tree, also known as the Wisdom Tree. This is where the Buddha is said to have meditated and found his way. This place is just as important to Buddhists as Jerusalem, Mecca or Rome are to other religions. Visitors come from the world's many Buddhist countries. But the story of Siddhartha, the son of a king, is famous almost everywhere. When he saw the suffering in the world, he decided to abandon his old life. It's a story that still touches people today and moves them to travel here to pray and to meditate. Siddhartha came back to palace and he asked his father, his aunt, and for everyone, what is the way to get rid of suffering? And he asked permission from anyone, I want to find a path what is the way to get rid of sufferings? And then the same day, he leave the house, he leave his wife and his son. He really loved them, but he wanted to 
get rid of all the sufferings for humanity. This is where Siddhartha found enlightenment 2,500 years ago. And Tanu enjoys meditating deeply here. It's a wonderful place, visited by people who have yearned to be here and who conduct themselves accordingly. No one here is controlled. Buddhism, it is said, is more of a philosophy than a religion. The impression gained is that many people here have found peace. Lord Buddha said, whatever you have or whatever you need, just try to be satisfied with that much things. Don't try to be too much uh, greedy. If you are too much greedy, you never be satisfied and you never be happy. But the large statue of the Buddha we take our leave of Tanu Varma and Bodh Gaya, a place that is very special. has become an Indian motorway. We're approaching Varanasi on the Ganges, the holiest city in Hinduism. It's early morning on the sacred river in Varanasi. Hundreds of thousands of people are joyfully taking a ritual bath. This is an exceptional moment in the life of any Hindu pilgrim. Anyone who bathes here in the Ganges, or even dies here, stands the greatest possible chance of escaping from the cycle of rebirth and entering Nirvana. Varanasi was already an ancient place of pilgrimage when Rome was founded. The city of Lord Shiva on the Ganges has been a cultural and religious center for over 3,000 years. On average, it is visited by 100,000 pilgrims every day, or 36 million a year. On the banks of the holy river, priests belonging to the Brahman caste sit under large sunshades. After bathing in the Ganges and having spruced up, each pilgrim goes to see a priest. I am a priest here. People come round all over the India. They come to me because the Brahman is the highest caste of the Hindu religion. So they come to me to have a blessing. So many kind of people come, like People come just for blessing, people come from bring the ashes for the parents, people come for also the who parents die, they do the pinda karma. So different kind of people come want to marry, people come want to wish something. So many kind of people come in. So it's going to be different, different karma. So we are the Brahman and we have to know the Vedas to know about that karma. So if people come here, then we bless them, then they give some money. The Brahman priests have taken over their job and the place where they sit from their fathers and forefathers. The yogis with their begging bowls also defend their traditional spots, which are passed by most of the pilgrims. Here in the city of Lord Shiva, the visitors are generous, and most of them no longer expect much from this earthly life. It means people want to come to die here to get the nirvana. So, incarnation of this place, even one stone, one stone like a Shiva. Where are you seat? This is also like a Shiva. So just why there is special because of the Shiva. All stones like Shiva Lingam. So 
in the earth is like a magnet. When people come, they feel like a home, joint with this magnet. In the world, two places is very holy and very powerful. First is Varanasi, and second in Jerusalem. The stream of pilgrims never abates, even at night. On the contrary, buying flower lights and making a flower lady happy is extremely popular. This ritual is known as Ganja Aarti. It is the start of a magical night by the Ganges. Buying a small light and letting it float on the river is a devotional ritual that uses fire as an offering. That alone makes it something the faithful should aspire to. When it is completely dark, the actual fire ritual gets underway. Clad in ceremonial clothing, chosen priests from the Brahmin caste celebrate it for several hours every night. Depending on the sensibilities of the observer, it's an atmosphere ranging from spiritual magic to religious show. Varanasi used to be known as Benares. In fact, its original name was Kashi, which means City of Light. The nightly Hindu ritual in Lord Shiva's metropolis does credit to a place that is thousands of years old. The Grand Trunk Road continues through the Indian capital, New Delhi. The Red Fort is a reminder of the cultural influences of the Mughal era and prepares us for an exciting border crossing into Pakistan. Before the British colonists left, they divided the subcontinent into two states, one Hindu, the other Muslim, a petition which has led to constant conflicts. Every evening, a ritual, which is probably unique worldwide, takes place at the heavily guarded Indo-Pakistani border, crossing near Lahore. To the delight of the many spectators, Pakistan's border unit demonstrates its defensive potential, goose-stepping and dressed in the style of the old colonial army. The same martial posturing takes place on the Indian side, vis-a-vis -vis the hostile sister state. Just before sunset, something exceptional happens. The border gate opens and the troop of guards from each country face one another ready to lower their respective flag. The Indian soldiers with their red headdresses and the Pakistanis in grey and black now move into top gear. To the cheers of the delighted onlookers, they show how dangerous they can be. But despite all the enmity, the overall impression is that the two sides are not prepared to renounce what they have in common. The armies of the two countries have fought wars against each other and sustained heavy losses. And there are still constant military clashes in Kashmir and the Himalayas. Nevertheless, this absurd border performance still takes place every evening as the two sides lower their flags together. Then the border is closed on both sides and the flags taken to a safe place for the night. in the days of Mughal rule, the fort in Lahore is one of the most important cultural monuments on the subcontinent and is a world cultural heritage site. Similar architectural styles can be found in Delhi and Agra. Were Lahore located in India, cultural travelers from many countries would come here every day. But Pakistan has an image problem, so only a handful of indigenous visitors stroll around an area of 20 hectares. The paintings and the architecture recall the 300 years in which 
Muslim Mughals from modern-day Uzbekistan ruled in ancient India. The Grand Trunk Road ran directly from New Delhi to Lahore, linking two cultural and commercial centers in colonial India. The Delhi Gate in the old town in Lahore was intended solely for goods traffic with India's modern-day capital. The Delhi Gate is still one of the entrances to the walled city, Lahore's historic old town. After weeks in India, the traveler feels like he is in the Muslim quarter of an Indian city. Life here takes place in the streets, open-air restaurants, lots of hustle and bustle, traders, and far more men than women out and about. No one described the mood in Lahore and on the Grand Trunk Road better than English writer Rudyard Kipling. Pakistani journalist Jari Jalil knows the history of Rudyard Kipling, his descriptions of Lahore and the Grand Trunk Road. A critical spirit, Jari Jalil works for the Dawn newspaper. This bookshop has many of Kipling's works on offer. Not only The Jungle Book, but also Kim, the novel which earned him the 1907 Nobel Prize for Literature. In it, Kipling describes the life of Kim, an Irish orphan, on the Grand Trunk Road in the colonial era. The novel is regarded as a unique document of living conditions in Lahore and on the road at the time. Well, actually, I think there's a lot of similarity in what um, the Grand Trunk Road is, how it's described in this book and how it is today. Because in this book, it's, um, it's said to be a river of life. And I think uh, today it's very, very true because uh, there are so many, there's so many random people that you meet in the Grand Trunk Road. There are sellers, salesmen, and there are trucks and buses going along, and people walking along the Trunk Road. You know, uh, there's so much like crowd over there. And and in the book, it was exactly the same way. So there's so much life. But essentially, the whole land of Pakistan, and we're talking about the Grand Trunk Road. So that, that uh, brings us back to uh, pre-partition India, British India. The whole land, even from that time till today, it's, it's not supposed to be militant. It is a very, it's a land full of liberalism, freedom. It's a land of people who want to believe in whatever they will want to believe. So historically speaking, it's not meant to be like that. But now it's becoming worse, slowly. Pakistan is different in ways that few people can imagine. No one would expect to find girl footballers training in public in shorts and without wearing a headscarf. But that too is possible. Not to say, however, that the girls aren't a contentious issue. At times they have to face criticism even within their own families. Some parents uh, didn't allow their children, but most of them are allow their children to play. Many people criticize because we are in Islamic Republic of Pakistan. So uh, people think that playing football is something uh, like a shame or wearing shorts and uh, uh, socks uh, and this, uh, people call it a shame. And when we say that we play football, they'll be like, oh my God, you play football. So when someone is trying to play, they try to criticize and kill their dreams. We believe that we can bring change if we, can, uh, we, if we are together and we play such games uh, in which uh, females are not uh, prominent or they are not playing or they are restricted. Over the last decade, fundamentalism and violence have been on the increase in Pakistan. But many people refuse to accept this. They want to preserve the diverse and liberal Pakistan of the past. Whoa. 
Our journey along the Grand Trunk Road continues as we head towards the border with Afghanistan. Right next to the main highway, we find a section of the old road from colonial times that has been preserved. A narrow, cobbled strip which at one time was used solely by ox carts, caravans, riders and pedestrians. Today, the Grand Trunk Road is dominated by colourfully painted Pakistani trucks. The pride and joy of any Pakistani haulier or driver is the personalised way his truck is decorated. On the Grand Trunk Road, there is one paint shop next to another, and these businesses earn good money for their customised art. Depending on customer requirements, trucks are decorated with flowers, ornaments or verses from the Koran. And money seems to be no problem. Clients are prepared to pay up to $800 to have their trucks painted. And that's a lot of money in this part of the world. Sometimes hauliers also have themselves portrayed on their vehicles. But in this case, it seems that the mustachioed truck owner had handed over a picture from his youth for use as a template. On our journey, we've reached the second important river on the subcontinent. What the Ganges is to India, the Indus is to Pakistan. The two rivers are lifelines bringing water and fertility from the Himalayas to arid regions. The route is getting rockier, and the mountains of Afghanistan closer. In recent years, this region has only been associated with violence and bombings. In the great game played by the world's powers, Peshawar, our final destination, is a city that has particularly suffered. On large posters, the inhabitants of Peshawar stress that they are not terrorists. They're fighting for their image, a difficult task. The tribal areas are constant trouble spots, and the proximity of the border sees violence flare up time and again. For us too, the Grand Trunk Road comes to an end at the historic Khyber Pass. The reason, we were told, is that the army is engaged in a punitive operation near the border. Peshawar is actually an ancient Indian trading center. The British recognized and exploited its commercial importance early on. Most of the population are Pashtuns, a people who are said to be proud and reliable, and exceptionally stubborn. The traditional food in Pashawa is legendary. One particular delicacy is spicy kebabs. Mixed with the scent of the street, they are fried in hot oil. Since the 1980s, Peshawar has provided a home for many refugees from Afghanistan, and they're particularly skillful in working with lapis lazuli. The most important veins of this blue stone lie in Afghanistan, and lapis lazuli can be smuggled into Peshawar without any problem. The profit margin in the trade with lapis lazuli and gems is roughly as high as in the drugs trade. Many Afghan refugee families have been forced to earn their livelihood from the stone. Afghan traders know all the tricks. Today, to fetch a higher price, Lapis lazuli products are sometimes stained. But Afghans know this and are on their guard. Genuinely pure lumps of lapis lazuli can fetch between $1,000 and $10,000 per kilogram. 
The stones usually end up in Singapore or China. Peshawar is a trading center, and for that reason alone, this is a cosmopolitan city. But Peshawar's recent history is so horrific as to be almost inconceivable. Shiite mosques are attacked time and again. But undeterred, the faithful still come to pray. Here we made the acquaintance of cardiologist Dr. Hamid Ahmed. He practices in a neighboring hospital, and in his breaks he comes to the mosque to pray. Whenever there is a blast, the injured persons and dead bodies come straight to our hospital, that is Lady Reading Hospital, where I am working. So that uh, time is very terrible because we people are just uh, listening about the blast, but we are seeing it and we see people with a lot of injuries and then uh, first time when this uh, relative of that uh, dead person or injured person reach to the hospital, they meet each other, and that uh, those scenes are very, very difficult to face. Everything is in uh, doubt. Nobody is clear who is attacking and who is attacking uh, for what purpose. But it seems to be involvement of different powers with different interests, and these powers are within the country and outside the country. So I can't elaborate it because we have very little knowledge about it. As always, in the Afghan border region too, a look back at the history of this part of the Grand Trunk Road is helpful. The great game played by the powerful nations for strategic positions, trade routes and spheres of influence has always been particularly pronounced here. Nevertheless, along the Grand Trunk Road, we've experienced the peaceful coexistence of different cultures and religions. Probably nowhere else in the world can such diversity still be admired on a road that is 2,500 kilometers long. <laughs>